Can I turn this mic on? Or, yeah. Okay. Um, lovely to see the decorations here. Whoever did it, thank you. Looks lovely. Um, it's a weird tradition that we take a tree from outside and bring it inside. Uh, don't know who started that, whose idea it was. And all the other trees are jealous that they don't get to be brought in. Or what, you know, another time during the year, it's like, um, can we come in? No, you can't come in. Only at Christmas time, but only certain trees. Anyway, surely the day is coming, it will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble, and the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees, the laws I give him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the children, the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Amminadab, Amminadab, the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Uzzah. Uzzah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Ammon. Ammon, the father of Josiah. And Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah, the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the father of Abihad, Abihad, the father of Elikim, Elikim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Akim, Akim, the father of Elihud, Elihud, the father of Eliezer, Eliezer, the father of Mahan, Mahan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, love this piece, the husband of Mary, and, mother, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah to accomplish. The anointing was a sign that God had chosen them out of other people to do something that God wants them to do. You see, Matthew writes, Matthew writes to show that Jesus is the promised one, the anointed one that Israel was looking for, that Israel was waiting for for years, hundreds, thousands even. They were waiting for the arrival of the Messiah, which is the name of this new three-week series that we're starting this morning. Can you imagine, I don't think we can now, but can you imagine waiting all those years? Hearing stories from your childhood about God. 
hearing stories from your childhood handed down from generations to generations. You heard them when you were a child. You grew up. You give them to your kids. You give them to your grandkids and on and on and on. Can you imagine then Andrew's excitement when he found the promised one? No wonder he ran and got his brother Peter and brought Peter to Jesus. The record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And even though we're not Jewish, we know enough about these men to say something about them, right? David, Abraham, of course we do. We know that both of these men are very important historical people in the story of God with Israel. David was the one that you know that was chosen by God, set apart by God, anointed by God, and established the royal line of Israel forever. Second Samuel 7. With Abraham, God made this promise, didn't he, in Genesis chapter 12, that all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's you and me. That's you and me. Did you hear me say that? That's you and me. And Jesus was the one that was going to fulfill that promise. There's another story. Now, Matthew's writing to Jewish people, okay? Matthew's writing to Jewish people. There's another story connected with Abraham that the Jewish people would know about. They would remember. It's the story of Abraham and Isaac in Genesis chapter 22. Jesus would be the son that would be sacrificed for the whole world. Jesus is the perfect lamb to be sacrificed. We'll learn more about that in two weeks from now. So right out the gate, Matthew establishes that Jesus is the promised king who would fulfill all God's promises in and from the Old Testament, who would sacrifice himself for the sake of the world so that the nations, all nations on the earth will be blessed. That's you and me. See, this long-expected reign of heaven is now coming to earth, bringing the Jewish story to a climax. Matthew begins by highlighting that Jesus was the son of David, Israel's most famous king, that he's the son of Abraham, Israel's founding patriarch. Jesus is the true Israelite, and Jesus is God's promised Messiah. As Matthew writes his gospel account, listen, the teaching of the kingdom of God was priority. There is 400 years where God didn't seem to speak. Can you imagine that? I don't think we can. He doesn't seem to speak between the Old Testament and the New Testament, as Warren Wearsby tells us. It's the bridge from the Hebrew Scriptures and that story to the Christian Scriptures in the New Testament. All the way back at Genesis chapter 12 is where we hear about this promised one. And that idea, that teaching, that hope of a promised one was very important to the Jewish people. See, even though Jesus was the promised one, the anointed one, the Jews didn't accept him as such because they had an idea of what the Messiah was going to do. They believed that the Messiah was going to set up an earthly kingdom and take Rome out of their land. And that's why they didn't handle Jesus very well, because they were thinking, this Messiah is going to establish an earthly kingdom, he's going to build a big army, and he's going to beat the fire out of Rome. That's why they didn't respond very well to Jesus. And maybe it's something like what we deal with today. You know the Burger King gospel that some of us believe in? Have it your way. You know that gospel? That, 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 we, that we believe, that we believe that God is here to give us everything we want. Forgetting that God, even before the creation of the world, had a purpose. Had a purpose to bless the whole world, not just you. There's no such thing as a Burger King gospel. Is there? You have it your way? God, I want you to do everything that... I want you to do. Never mind everybody else and saving the whole world and having a purpose. I want you to answer my prayers. And maybe that's why we respond the way we do sometimes to God when he doesn't give us what we want. 
Maybe. How many times have you heard a scripture like this? 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God or the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You've heard that scripture many times before, haven't you? Heard it, probably heard it in the Bible class. All scripture is God-breathed. Yes. All scripture is useful. Even the genealogy that I read to you. Yes, of course it is. Some people aren't interested in genealogies. Some people are. Some aren't. No. But I'll tell you this. If I got word that a very wealthy man with the last name McGuigan died and he didn't have any heirs, I would become very interested very quickly in genealogies. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? But that hasn't happened to me, so I'm not interested in genealogies, really. But I tell you this, we should be interested in this one from Matthew. And here's why I say that. You see, this list of names, it goes a long way back. And it speaks of God in relationship with humans. God. Not humans and humans. God with humans. It speaks of God reminding us one name at a time that He wants to fellowship with us, that He wants to be with us and around us. It speaks of God being faithful to His promise to Abraham to bless the whole world, all the nations. That's you and me. Genealogies may be boring to us, but to the Jewish people, they were very important. One more time, Matthew's writing to Jewish people. For Israel's kings, for Israel's Chosen kings had to be Jewish, and a little while later, they had to come from the line of David, the kingly line of David. And when the Jewish people returned from Babylonian captivity, that remnant had to prove they were Jewish. How do you think they did that? Through their genealogies. These genealogies were legal proof of inheritance rights and kingship. Today, or within the last couple of five years, we are encouraged to look at our genealogies through things like Ancestry.com and different websites where you give something from yourself and they then tell you where you're from. We do have interest in it sometimes, don't we? We might even spend a hundred bucks or unless it's on discount for Christmas or Black Friday or something like that. So as we look at these names on this genealogy of Jesus, we see a lot of names that we're very familiar with, the big ones. And hopefully you've got the Bible open and you'll look at some of the names if you can find them in them. I'm sure you can. Some of the obvious ones are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, yeah? And, and Boaz, and, and, and David, and Ruth, and Solomon, and Jacob. Isaiah is in here. Isaiah, as you know, is mentioned in Isaiah, Isaiah. Isaiah, yeah. Isaiah is mentioned in Isaiah 6.1. It says, In the year that King Isaiah died, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord seated high on a throne and exalted. I know you recognize the name Josiah. Yes, Josiah. He became a king at age eight, though he wasn't the youngest king. There was someone who was seven years old who became king. And he was, uh, Josiah was used by God to bring God's people back to God. They find the book of the law. He encourages them to read it. He turns down all the Asherah poles and the Baals and whatnot. What I want you to observe from these names is to remember it's not just a list of names. It's not just a genealogy. It's not just names on a paper that most of us have no interest in reading. No interest in it. There's something in my mask that's been bothering me since I got up here. It was a hair or something. Maybe you noticed it, maybe you didn't, and now you're noticing it because I've <laughs> brought it to your attention. Sorry about that. These are names, but not just names. It's not just a genealogy. 
It's Bible people. Craig reminded me a couple of weeks ago, it's not Bible characters. They're Bible people. They're real people who lived on this earth many years ago. And the point I'd like to make is this. Jesus was a real person. Tell me something I don't know, Billy. I can't. Jesus was a real person who was born into a real human family, who had other real family and real parents and grandparents and whatnot. I know that might sound silly to you, but it's of critical importance. And I'll tell you why it's important to realize that Jesus was human. It's a truth that a lot of people out there, religious people, want to deny that Jesus is God in the flesh. Don't have time to read it, but read 1 John 4, 1 and 2. I think I'm bringing that up next week. Anyway, connected to Jesus being a real person, born into a real human family at a certain time of history in the world, is that Jesus is in the lineage of Abraham and David. And I just don't want you thinking I'm repeating myself for the sake of repeating myself. I'm not. Abraham and David were big in the areas of covenants. Uh, covenant, as you know, is an agreement between two people or two parties. Um, uh, uh, those, people, those of us who are married, we made a covenant before people saying something like, till death do us part in sickness and in health or better for worse and things like that. I've already mentioned briefly the two scriptures of the covenant with David and the covenant with Abraham. I want to read both of them. I've only got a slide for one of them, but you can listen. Here's Genesis chapter 12. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to a land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. In the covenant with Abraham, Abram, his name hadn't changed yet. The covenant with Abram, and Abram's name means exalted father, and the name Abraham literally translated means father of a multitude. We know God wanted to bless Abram with a son. We also know that God wanted to bless the whole world with his son, Jesus. And then in the covenant that God made with King David, we read this, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 11. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and when you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom." He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of man, with floggings inflicted by man. But my, listen, my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from you, uh, from before you. See, the fulfillment of both of these covenants, the one with David, the one with Abraham, with these two real men, is Jesus, who, yes, is Jesus, the one, the anointed one, the chosen one who will fulfill the blessing covenants. And one more time, you've heard me say this over and over, but it's worth saying again, our God is a promise maker, and he's a promise keeper. And this is going to be seen in the name, one of the names, in this genealogy of Matthew. One name, Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth. It's going to be seen in the arrival of Jesus of Nazareth. It's going to be seen in the res death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Listen, at the beginning of the lesson, I read Malachi chapter 4, into Matthew chapter 1. And I did that for a specific reason, to make the point that it's a continuing story of God in relationship with people, with humans. Not human to human, though it's human father of the father of the father of. It's about God connecting and relating with humans. And even though there was silence for 400 years, as soon as God speaks again in the New Testament, 
Matthew points us back to the Old Testament. To say that we don't need or it's not useful, the, the, the Old Testament, that's bad Bible reading. It's bad Bible reading. To think and, and maybe even be tempted to read over it or not read it or not pay attention to the names would miss the entire history of the story of God with the nation of Israel, starting with Abraham down to Jesus. And if there was a list somewhere else, there would be your name in it somewhere, wouldn't it? Your name would be in there somewhere, of course. 400 years of silence, 400 years of waiting, 400 years of questions. Will rescue come? Will love come down? Will God ever speak again? Church, from silence to salvation. Don't miss that, okay? From silence to to salvation. I don't think we could ever imagine waiting for 400 years to hear a word from God. We don't even live that long to hear a word from God or to never hear a word from God in your lifetime. 400 years ago, the Mayflower departed Southampton in England. 400 years ago. 400 years ago, the first merry-go-round was seen in a fair in Falafelis, Turkey. Around 400 years ago, though it's 410 to be exact, Galileo proved the planets orbit around the sun. 400 years ago. That's quite a long time, isn't it? 400 years ago. You weren't even a thought. Not by humans anyway. I don't know about you, but I can't even wait for a two-day Amazon Prime to be delivered. 400 years? Mm. Must have felt like an eternity for those people waiting to hear a word from God. And the longer it went on, the worse it seemed to get. I'm sure for these people, it must have looked like God's forgotten us. Never mind being in the Babylonian exile for 70 years. 400? Is he going to talk again? Is he on what, vacation? Has he died? What's, where is he? Must have looked like God had forgotten about his people, forgotten about the promises he made to them. Can we, can we any of us here, relate to this idea of waiting? Waiting? When God seems to go silent, we're praying and praying and praying and praying, and he doesn't seem to answer. Are you, are you, are you still there? Can you hear? When, when God seems to go silent, it doesn't take long for us to assume, wrongly of course, that God's forgotten about us. Suddenly we begin to take matters into our own hands, walking away from the will of God, doing whatever we want to do and expecting him to respond. But know this, God is always at work in the waiting. He's always at work. God has always been at work. He doesn't stop working. He's always been at work. What we need to understand is that this waiting reminds us of who is ultimately in control and that he's preparing the next step for people, for you, for me, for the world. Could it be Maybe. Could it be that God is giving us an opportunity to deepen our faith in Him in the waiting? How come you're not answering the prayer? How come you're not answering the prayer? Answer the prayer. Answer the prayer. Will you answer the prayer? I need you to wait. I'm working it out. If we could stop long enough, I think we would hear something like that, wouldn't you? See, maybe at this moment you're in the middle of a season of waiting. Maybe it's been a frustrating couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, maybe even a couple of years. You are in a season, and seasons always change. God is at work in this season of waiting. Again, it might be God giving us an opportunity to say, Trust me. I've got you. I know what I'm doing. I've been at this a long time. Maybe it's given us an opportunity 
to look for and look and find Jesus in the situation. God could be giving us an opportunity to deepen our faith in him. Make sure you hear that, okay? And Jesus is the only one, only one, who can ultimately fulfill and completely fulfill and perfectly fulfill the desires of our hearts. Hmm. Do you look to Jesus in the waiting? Do you? See, if you're not happy in this season of your life, Look to Jesus. If you're feeling helpless or hopeless in a current situation, look to Jesus. If you're feeling happy and if you're feeling hopeful, continue to look to Jesus. Look for him. Look for his arrival. Jesus is the ultimate hope and joy, even when the wait feels like 400 years. Through Jesus, the wait is over, and our souls will find rest in the promises of God fulfilled by Jesus. You know, maybe this morning, maybe, maybe not, but maybe, maybe this morning we have learned through reading of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, that we see God at work in humans in humans, in humans with names that some of us cannot pronounce correctly, where we may not know what they're about. They're in the Scriptures, though. They're Bible people who lived in Bible times for a purpose. And at times, as we see this list of people and names, we may have to wait For they did, didn't they? For more than 400 years, though it was 400, it might have been 700. It's probably more like 1,400 years. At this time of the year, you and I will wait on the arrival of the Savior of the world because there's more to our story. You're going to have to come back next week. You're going to have to tune in next week if you want to hear the rest of the story because it's not done. It's not over. And even when this sermon series is over and Jesus has arrived, the story isn't over. It's not over. God bless you in your believing and in your waiting for the arrival of Jesus of Nazareth, whose birth changed the whole world.